to defer to Senator Mark Wayne Mullen. Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. And I, I want to make a, a very clear, I'm not against unions. I'm not at all. Uh, some of my very good friends work for unions. Uh, they work hard and they do a good job. Um, and so my statements, please don't make uh, an assumption that I'm anti-union. But I also want to set the record straight. All three of you guys have talked about employers being intimidated, intimidating their employees. But you guys haven't ever spoke about when the unions try to unionize, the intimidation they have to other people that aren't wanting to unionize. You guys don't mention that. Because see, I started with nothing. Absolutely nothing. In fact, I started below nothing. And I started growing this little plumbing company with six employees to now we have over 300 employees. And back in 2009, you guys tried to unionize me. My guys were making money. They were getting paid more than the union halls were paying their plumbers. Our benefits were better. But because we started bidding jobs that were union jobs and winning those, union pipe fitters decided they were going to come after us. They would show up at my house. They'd be leaning up against my trucks. I'm not afraid of a physical confrontation. In fact, sometimes I look forward to it. I'm, that's not my problem. But when you're doing that to my employees, and then when, they, when that didn't work, they started picketing our job site, saying, shame on Mullen. Shame on Mullen. For what? For what? Because we were paying higher wages? Because we had better benefits and we wasn't requiring them to pay your guys' absorbent salaries? You talk about CEOs that are making all this money? And what do you make, Mr. O'Brien? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah, Senator. I know what you make because in 2019, your salary was, um, what is this, 193000 I'm sure you got some pay raises since then. Yeah, when I was a And the average UPS driver, the feeder driver, makes... Thirty-five thousand a year. That's and what do you bring. That's to the inaccurate. Table? Hold on a second. That's inaccurate. State no, facts. I've got it right here. State facts. That's inaccurate. The average UPS feeder driver makes thirty-five thousand. If you don't know your facts, then maybe you should. Oh, be I, I know position. them because I negotiate the contract. So I say, I say one thing to you. What do you bring for that salary? What do I bring? Yeah. What do you, What do you, What job have you committed or have you have you uh, uh, started? What job have you created? One job other than sucking the paycheck out of some other body, somebody else that you want to say that you're trying to provide because you're forcing them to pay dues? And no, then, we don't force them. Senator, you've asked the question. You're out of line, Let man. Actually, I have question. it, and don't tell me I'm out you of line. You are out of line. Don't tell me I'm out of line. Well, you, you, you frame, don't tell me. You I'm frame, frame, you frame, you frame Third, the statement you need to shut tough your guy. mouth yeah. because you don't know you're what you're talking about. You're going to tell me to shut my mouth? Yes, I did. Hold it. Hold it. Tough guy. I'm not afraid of physical. Senator, hold it. But don't sit there and tell me I'm out of line. Senator. You made a statement. You asked the question. I didn't ask the question. You did it. You did. I answered question. the question. You asked the question. About how well, much it was rhetorical. Let him answer. It was, rhetor it was a rhetorical Let, Well, question. you may think it's rhetorical. It Sounded was rhetorical. Sounded to me like a question. Let him answer the question. I'm not yielding my time to him. So if you're going to let me keep my time, that's fine. You'll have your time. Let him. You ask a question. question. He has so, a right to answer that. As far as my salary goes... My salary, if you follow me around, I walk, I actually look at this building. I bet you I work more hours than you do, twice that's, as many that's hours. That's impossible. But no, that is, that's true. Sir, you don't secondly, know what hard work is. Secondly, if you want to follow yeah. my schedule, be Secondly, be, I'll do it in a follow. minute. Secondly, UPS feeder drivers, and you can quote uh, Carol Tomei, who quoted this, they make 93000 on the lower end. Some I of them make 150000 I said feeder drivers. Feeder drivers, tractor trailer drivers. Some of them make $150,000 per year. Some of them do. And I don't disagree with that. Most of them make over. Four, most of them, after you've been there four years, most of them make over a thousand. Uh, okay. Most of them make over a hundred thousand. So reclaiming my time, I go back to the whole fact that, sir, you haven't created a job. We haven't. You haven't been there. You haven't. Sure, we have. You haven't. Sure, we have. Tell me one job that you created. What do you, What do you talk? Like, be specific. You're like, an employer. You no, we're not employed people. No, but. You know, it's funny. So, no, then, we, we create, then, then we create opportunity. Jobs. We create opportunity because we Sir, hold that's, that's we not, hold greedy CEOs like yourself not, accountable. You call me a greedy CEO. Oh yeah, you are. You want to attack my salary? I'll attack yours. You're, what did ahead. you make? What did you make when you owned your company? When I made my company. I kept my salary down at about uh, fifty thousand a year because I invested every penny into it. Okay, all right. You mean you hid money? No, I didn't hide. Oh, oh. hold on a second. Okay, he said that's out of line. 
You said right, I was out. We're even. We're, he's, even. He's, he's, we're not even. We're not even close to being even. You I think know. you're smart? You think you're funny? No, you're you, not. You think you're funny? No, I never said. I, did I smile? You frame. You frame your opening. Hold on, hold on. Let's. You frame your opening statement. Saying you're a Senator. Tough guy. Continue. This, uh, this Senator, is, please this continue is your behavior, statements. But sir, this is. A, I think. I think it's great that you're doing this because Me too. this shows their behavior on how they try to come in and no, organize a show. No, no it's and just, they say about intimidation, and it's not about intimidation. This, it's they not show your behavior. Yep. Stay on the issue, please. The issue is if you're really for the employee. Then why are you against right to work? Why are you against private ballots? Okay. If you're really about the employee, let the employee make the choice. I'm not anti-union, but when you don't want to have a private ballot, that's not intimidating. That's not intimidating. Why wouldn't you want a private ballot? If that is intimidating the employee. If you don't want a right to work state, don't force somebody to make to pay dues to an organization they may not agree with. Don't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. That's called employee choice. If you want to be part of a union, God bless you. Be part of a union. I have no issue with that. But don't sit up here and say that an employee is the one that intimidates their employer, their, or their employers are intimidating their employees not becoming a union. Okay, Senator, That's not thank accurate. you. Thank you very much. Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I actually would like to start by recognizing how much progress that we have made. At the story will come back to that because it sounds like something to do. I, I hope you do. I'll defer to Senator Mark Wayne Muller. Well, thank you. And uh, considering the chairman doesn't want to hear any of that information because I believe he's pretty biased in his opinion already. Mr. Schultz, I'll give you an opportunity to finish that if you'll do it quick. Thank you very much. So, as you might imagine, uh, we're very curious to understand what happened in Buffalo. And uh, we later found out that this individual, which, which was hired in 2020, was paid for and under the employment of the union that was basically trying to organize Starbucks. We later found out there was more than one person. And so you might want to ask yourself, uh, what, where's the fairness, right. the objectivity, and the integrity of what we're we're talking about here today. No, and I, I, I mean, if you're anti-union as a CEO, you're anti-union busting or you're for union busting. I'm not saying you're anti-union. I'm just saying that it seems like to me as a former CEO, not nearly at the success that you were at, sir, and I'm not trying to defend your company uh, because quite frankly, politically, we're on totally different ends of the spectrum. Um, and so the irony of this hearing is actually kind of funny. And I do want to point out some hypocrisy about this hearing with the chairman and it's not trying to get personal. All this information is going to be very public. But the fact that you can't defend your company because you want to have a good relationship with your employees and you believe in employee value, which we all do. Any CEO knows that the success of our companies are based on our employees. We get that. Um, but it seems like unions today, all they want to do is fight with, the, with, the, with their, their employees or their employer. The same employer that is hiring those, those team members. And that friction causes a, a, a very volatile... And, 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 and tough workplace. And if the company and the employees aren't in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, then they can't, neither one can be successful. And, 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 and unions themselves, if you're part of a union, you can never be an executive, you can never be a manager, and never be a CEO. And if you can't be an executive or a manager or the CEO, then how are you actually gonna implement the changes that the unions want in those, in those positions to begin with? And it seems like they actually hold back their team members. Mm -hmm. But I take offense to, to the, the chairman pointing out that all CEOs are corrupt because they're millionaires. You know, if you make a lot of money, you're, you're corrupt. If, yet no. it, it, yet it, it's, it's bothering to me because, Mr. Chairman, you yourself have been very successful. Rightfully so. Glad you have. And you've been in office for 28 years, and you and your wife has, have, have immersed a, a wealth of over $8 million dollars. And, and in fact, your quote on, 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 being, on, on being wealthy and being a millionaire was, well, if you write a bestseller, you can be a millionaire too. If you can be a millionaire, why can't Mr. Schultz and other CEOs be millionaires and be honest too? If that's the case, then why is it that Mr. Schultz, who actually creates jobs and a bestseller of a book, isn't creating any jobs? Why is it that he's corrupt and you're not? Why is it that all CEOs are corrupt because they're wealthy, and yet our chairman, who is wealthy, and I'm glad you are, you're not. Guys, the government's role is to create an environment for entrepreneurs. 
for go-getters, for, job, for world changers, to be successful in life. The U.S. government is, to des is designed for people that want to succeed can. We can go out and achieve anything that we choose to. But when you lean towards socialism, what you think is government is the answer and unions are the choice. And if you're against us, then you're dead wrong and you must be corrupt. That's not the world we're living in. That's not the America that we believe in. And I'm not against unions. If you want to choose to be in a union, be in a union. But if you choose not to, then you choose not to. And that's why I'm good with right-to-work states. That's honestly why unions actually thrive in Oklahoma and we're right-to-work states. Because it creates a happy environment and a, and a good environment because employees get to choose what they want to be part of. And the employer can have a say in it. What is wrong with choice? What is wrong with employees having a choice? What is wrong with the CEO defending his company and openly saying that he is providing good benefits and paying higher than everybody else? But yet, if you're not part of a union, you're also paying starvation wages. What hypocrisy? What bias? Chairman, you are chair of the health, education, Labor and Pension Committee. We shouldn't have a biased approach. We should have what's best for America and all those that want to thrive and work in it. And so while we politically disagree, Mr. Schultz, I applaud you for your success. And I applaud all the CEOs out there for their success and all the employees that work hard, that's in the same boat, that's making their companies great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me respond. As the senator did mention my name, I think. <laughs> and I think you got an old time record here. You've made more misstatements in a shorter period of time than I have ever heard. Please correct Apparently, me. Apparently, if I'm worth eight million dollars, excuse me. It's all public. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Excuse me. Yes, sir. If I'm worth eight million dollars, that's good news to me. <laughs> I'm not aware of it. That's a lie. All right. Number two. Part of public records. That's, you're probably looking at some phony right-wing internet stuff. It ain't true. No. All right, you should read I, beyond that. It is not true. It's All right? public records. It, yeah. No, it is not public record. Okay. Well, you made 1.7 million on your public book. It is not public record. You made 1.7 right? on your book. Excuse me. I've got the mic now. Number Did you two. Make the statement I have that you want to the be a mic now. I've got it. Did you, you not make time. that statement? You had your time. Okay. All right. You're not telling the truth. Second of all, you got no evidence that I have ever said that all CEOs are corrupt. I have never, ever said that. Probably not Further, all, but, but every time you talk about not, CEOs, you, you shouldn't say that. Say it. Furthermore, what this hearing is about is whether or not you talk about being pro-union, really. What this hearing is about is whether workers have the constitutional right to form a union. The evidence is overwhelming, not from me but for the National Labor Relations Board is the time after time after time, despite what Mr. Schultz is saying. Starbucks has broken the law and has prevented workers from joining unions to collectively bargain for decent wages and benefits. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Schultz, I want to begin. Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Mark Wayne Mullen. Thank you, uh, Senator, and um, thank you for our panelists for being here. I, I'm going to address a question real quick about why is it so expensive. Fourteen years ago, my wife and I uh, wanted to provide health care for, for our employees. It was actually going to be a benefit because we were having a lot of employees miss work because they couldn't find child health care. So we went through the process of trying to set it up, and it was crazy how expensive it was. Then outside of that, the liability that it brought to our company honestly outweighed the benefit of it. Because of how much regulations that we pour on these, on these early child development centers, preschool, it makes it almost cost prohibitive. And so if we really want to fix cost, we should start looking at ourselves and seeing out a way that we can soften the amount of regulations and still keep our kids safe. Now, let me get to the 
to, to the point of my, my questions and kind of make a point here. When we're trying to federalize our education system, to me it sounds like we're trying to move more towards socialism. Because when you federalize an education system, you're standardizing what you're gonna be teaching our kids and taking the parents out of the ability to have a say in it. And, and so I have, very, I have a lot of concerns by this, and it still baffles me that the chairman of our committee, Health Education, I'm gonna put, right, put that big, Health Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, is a, that was appointed by our Senate Democrats is a self-proclaimed socialist. I, I'm not just calling that, Chairman, you, you openly say that you're a socialist. In your book, Outsider uh, in the House, the chairman says, Bill Clinton is a moderate Democrat. I'm a Democrat socialist. That's over our education system. I have a book here in, here in front of me called Our Skin that has been endorsed by NACI. Uh, and I'm going to read exactly what this book says. You guys might find it interesting. A long time ago, way before you were born, a group of white people made up an idea called race. They sorted people by skin color and said that white people were better, smarter, prettier, and they deserved more than everybody else. This would be taught if we socialize our pre-K system. This would be taught. Do you disagree with that findings in the book? A thousand percent. Really? How about we teach Jesus loves me? How about, how about this? In teaching Jesus loves, loves the little children, the lyrics go red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in our sight. Now, which one would you think would be better? I'll ask everybody on the panel, which is better to teach? This, that is a, a story that was made up to teach our kids, three-year-olds who have no idea what race is, now all of a sudden is being taught that white people said this as a truth. Someone pointed at me that this being a truth, that white people developed race, that white people developed that, that all of a sudden that was our word that we developed. By the way, I'm Cherokee, Native American. I think we have experienced a little bit of racism before in my life, Chairman. Senator Mullen. So, so I ask everybody on the panel, which one is better to teach? This or the Jesus loves me lyrics? Ma'am, I'll start down here. Just tell yeah, me which yeah. one. I don't have time for an explanation. What I'll tell you, Senator Mullen, is that what children um, in these early years no, no, develop no, no. their identity. I didn't ask the question. The, it's the important, question is, is which it's important one do you that think our is classrooms to, are. I'm just asking which one is better. To Let her answer, answer the question, please. I, the, my question is this. She will which answer one is if better? she sees fit. Which one is better? It's important, this? It's important that children's identity that's and not language my and question. culture are recognized. That's not answering my question. And that's, that's what creates strong that, executive okay, function. Okay, if you don't want to answer my question, that's fine. Let's move on down the panel. Which one is better to be taught? This book or the Jesus Loves Me lyrics that says everybody's, that everybody's skin doesn't matter. They're all precious in his sight. I think it's important to teach that all children are seen and valued for who they are. And that's so, what But when you teach this, don't you think that other people are start saying that white kids are to blame? No. I think it's important. It's exactly what they're going to teach. It's exactly what it is, ma'am. I disagree. Um, first, it is important that we teach Jesus. And Absolutely. Jesus is what we teach. So which one is but better? But the reality this, is. So do you think this is Could the Could she answer the question, please? No, I don't want reality. I'm asking the question, which one is better? That is exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Got okay. it on tape. <laughs> misspoke. So uh, what I'm saying is, is which one is which? Which one is better to be taught, Mr. Chairman? Is it this or is it, or is it the Jesus? Is your question directed to me or Ms. Woman? Well, you keep interrupting me saying they're not asking the question. Want to ask and I the wish question? you really sat on no, the no, question. No, no, no. It's his question. Time. He gets to dictate it. Which not one? Not dictate it. Ask the question. Which one? Talking to Ms. Woman, right? Yes. As I stated, Jesus is always first. Absolutely. I agree with that. So let me end with this because I still have more time because the chairman kept interrupting me. I'm going to close with two quotes, okay? The first is from John Adams. It says, morality and virtue are the foundation of a republic and necessary for society to be free. The second one is from our socialist communist, Joseph Stalin. That says, education is a weapon whose effect depends on who hands it is in and whom it is aimed. We gotta be careful what we're trying to do here. 
With that, I yield back. Senator Bolton. Uh, and I'm going to read exactly what this book says. You guys might find it interesting. A long time ago, way before you were born, a group of white people made up an idea called race. They sorted people by skin color and said that white people were better, smarter, prettier, and they deserved more than everybody else. This would be taught if we socialize our pre-K system. This would be taught. Do you disagree with that findings in the book? A thousand percent. How really? about we teach Jesus loves me? How about, how about this? In teaching Jesus loves, loves the little children, the lyrics go red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in our sight. Now, which one would you think would be better? I'll ask everybody on the panel. Which is better to teach? This, that is a, a story that was made up to teach our kids. Three-year-olds who have no idea what race is, now all of a sudden is being taught that white people said this as a truth. Someone pointed at me that this being a truth, that white people developed race, that white people developed that, that all of a sudden that was our word that we developed. By the way, I'm Cherokee, Native American. I think we have experienced a little bit of racism before in my life, Chairman. Senator Mullen. So, so I ask everybody on the panel, which one is better to teach? This or the Jesus loves me lyrics? Ma'am, I'll start down here. Just tell yeah, me which yeah. one. I don't have time for an explanation. What I'll tell you, Senator Mullen, is that what children um, in these early years no, no, develop no, no. their identity. I didn't question. The, it's the important, question is, is which it's important one that our classrooms are. I'm just asking which one is better. To Let her answer the question, please. I, the, my question is this. She will which answer one is if better? she sees fit. Which one is better? It's important, this? It's important that children's identity that's and not language and my culture are recognized. That's not answering my question. And that's, that's what creates strong that, executive okay, function. If, if you don't want to answer my question, that's fine. Let's move on down the panel. Which one is better to be taught? This book or the Jesus Loves Me lyrics that says everybody's, that everybody's skin doesn't matter. They're all precious in his sight. I think it's important to teach that all children are seen and valued for who they are. And that's so, what But when you teach this, don't you think that other people are start saying that white kids are to blame? No. I think it's important. It's exactly what they're going to teach. It's exactly what it is, ma'am. I disagree. Um, first, it is important that we teach Jesus. And Absolutely. Jesus is what we teach. So which one is but better? But the reality this, is. So do you think this is Could the Could you answer the question, please? No, I don't want reality. I'm asking the question, which one is better? That is exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Got okay. it on tape. <laughs> misspoke. So uh, what I'm saying is, is which one is which? Which one is better to be taught, Mr. Chairman? Is it this or is it or is it the Jesus? Is your question directed? Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Ms. Bradford, in your testimony, did I understand you right? Said that you want to end all plastic manufacturing? I said the plastics industry must be stopped. So does that mean end plastic manufacturing? I mean, in my dream world, sure. But I think that... So um, Oh, so oh what, go ahead. So I, I, and I don't mean to be condescending here. I just point out what's going to replace your glasses. Um, like, so how would I you do wear know. Your glasses around your face. They're, they're made of plastic. Maybe. No, I don't know are. what they're made out of. They are. What, so, what about, and, and I just point out some things here because I just want to be realistic when we're having conversations because when statements are made like this, I just want to open people's eyes and say, well, what? Okay, that's easy to say, but what's the solution? Your water bottle in front of you. This one? Yes. That plastic? No. The lid is. That's plastic. Right. So right. It, I would it, say to your question will, that I would first be concerned about single-use plastics, and then we can talk your, about alternatives your, to this. Your, your cell phone there? The plastic? The cases. But it's glass because I broke oh, the components the inside of it not yesterday. Plastic? The components made out of it's not in plastic? It, they are. The water that you filled that water bottle up with. Um, where'd you fill that water bottle up out of? A water filling station. All right, and it was delivered by a drink station that was plastic? I didn't check. The edges are. The piping coming to it. Now, you have a couple of choices with the piping. Um, we could go back to using wood, but then you have to have line it in chemical. Uh, or we could go back <coughs> and use lead, because we used to have water piping that was lead. That was harmful to us. Uh, we go back to galvanized but galvanized rust and had discoloration. Um, we go back to copper, but 
but copper has to be mined, and everybody wants to stop mining in the U.S., so you use plastic to deliver piping that you fill that water bottle up with today. I, I point this out because the clothes you have on, I guarantee you have plastic in it. The shoes you have on your feet, the soles of those shoes are plastic. So we talk about any, any manufacturer, plastic manufacturing, and everybody in here cheers when you say that, but everybody here is depending on plastic as you set. So if you want to end it, then quit using it. It's kind of like, I don't sharp it or shop at certain places right now because I don't agree with some of their policies. I choose not to do that. You can choose to not use plastic. Do your work. If, 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 if you believe it, then live it that way. And, and, and if not, then tell me what the solution is. Mr. Sunday, can you manufacture a car today without plastic? Because we talked about manufacturing, the chairman brought up manufacturing cars, is it is safe. But the components that go into the cars today, can you do that without, without plastic? No, Senator, and increasingly so with the new uh, mileage mandates. You increasingly need to use automotive components that are plastics derived. So we wouldn't have manufacturing, today's modern manufacturing, if we didn't have plastics, correct? Correct. Ms. Jackson, do you agree with that statement? Yes. So what's the alternative for manufacturing? Because we, the Democrats talk about middle class wages. Middle class wages typically come directly from manufacturing. What is it that we're manufacturing that doesn't have plastic in it today? Nothing, and you know what? It would increase the cost of everything if we turn to an alternative and it would disproportionately impact low-income people who have lower incomes, it would be another regressive tax on the poor. So according to your testimony, Ms. Jackson, it, it sounds like you're saying that the environmental justice agenda does more harm than good for low-income families. Is that correct? Yes. And, you know, I, I have the unique uh, uh, opportunity to see both sides when the industry comes in the area and when it doesn't. As an auditor, I worked uh, on Nissan North America. Mm -hmm. Nissan North America moved to Smyrna, Tennessee, where it built the largest automotive manufacturing plants. And the transformation was astonishing. I mean, it went from a community that was poor to a community that U.S. World News Wow. Voted one of the top 10 places to retire. You had poor people in areas that were poor that became middle class. You had middle class people that became upper middle class and a lot of upper middle class people that became affluent. They have attractions, they have amenities, they have uh, housing, affordability. I mean, the amount of prosperity in that area has resonated out three counties, three counties. I've also had the opportunity to see when an industrial, uh, and that did, wouldn't happen if you don't have an industrial complex moving into the area where you're talking about high economics. I've also seen the other side where all of a sudden you have deteriorating building, empty storefronts, dilapidated housing, people standing on street corner housing, that uh, uh, families that are broken. So we need to balance the fact that people's lives need economic upward mobility. And we can't just say, uh, we're gonna take out an industry and leave people poorer than they were. Poverty causes the worst health care in this country. Poverty is the one that destroys lives. It destroys health. It creates trauma. So we need to make sure that when we're talking about these issues, we take into account the human loss of life, not just the environmental impacts. Thank you. Thanks for your indulgence. There's a crisis in our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Mullen? Yeah, I just want to follow up with Ms. Bradford. You stated you're against single-use plastics. What? specifically are you pointing at for single use? What products are you talking about? Good, thanks. Um, so definitely straws, definitely plastic bottles, 
I won't say anything else because I can't think of anything else right so, now. So are you for recycling and advanced recycling? Uh, no, because it doesn't work and it doesn't happen. Well, then, then in your case and everything, single use at that point. If you're not for recycling, then you, you can't say you're against single use and you're okay with everything else. Because if you're against I'm it, for facts, it. and I think only 9% worldwide are actually recycled. That, that's why I say that we should focus more on recycling. Because if you can tell me you're for recycling, then maybe we can work to something. Because a while ago you did say you were for you were you wasn't against all of it because you got to be realistic, but you're against single use because that's what the chairman asked you. And so if you're if if, if you're for against single use, then you must be for recycling. No, because it doesn't work. Well, then that doesn't make any sense um, at all. Okay. Because you can't exist without plastic today. You, you, we've already pointed that out. And so I, I don't know what the alternative is. And we talk about this all the time. It's like Ms. Levin mentioned that uh, that glass is an alternative. Uh, but if you remember, sir, at our last hearing we had on plastic, um, I, I, for the record, I submitted the McKinsey and Company study that showed that actually plastic has a less carbon footprint than glass. So where are we moving towards? What is it that we want to look to? Uh, if, we're, if we're still for the middle class, and we've got to have manufacturing, we pointed that out, uh, that we can't do without it. Uh, we're against it, but yet everybody here is using it. I just see a lot of people having a thought process because it sounds good, but no one's actually living by what you believe. I don't have any single-use plastics in my house. You know that for a I, fact? I know that for a fact because what I go... What products do you not have? What products? Because you just mentioned water bottles. I don't have water bottles like that in my house. But most of these water bottles are actually recycled, including the one that I'm having. So right I do... I am a masochist, and I do participate in recycling. I just know that it doesn't work internationally. It's not okay. adding up. Well, I, I would suggest you maybe doing your homework a little bit more when you come up here and you start talking about this stuff, that you actually understand what it is, the impact that you're talking about. I because do my homework. I do understand the impact. I do know I'm wasting my time recycling because most of it's not recycled. Then, and that's because of the industry. And the fact okay. that plastic is in everything is because the industry forced us to have it. Then quit using plastics. Well, the industry should stop making them. Quit using them. If you feel that way, then I quit. do. I just told you I do not have single-use plastic bottles in my house. I but do what I can. Against, hold on a second. You're against all plastic, but you have plastic all around you. So if you're against plastic, then don't use it. Live by what you're saying. There's a lot of people around here that I disagree with, but if you'd live it, I do live it. I respect it. Maybe you don't because you have plastic on your face, you have plastic on the water bottle, you have plastic on your I feet, do you not own companies to create these things. So I cannot make these things. But until they are available, well, we're stuck with some things. I do what I can. Do you believe in? Uh, do, you, do you believe that we should have solar systems, or not solar systems, but uh, um, we should we should have um, solar panels on our house? I do, but I'm here to talk about so, so solar panels. What's on the plastic. agenda? I mean, they are, and they're also not single use. Neither is just bottle. Um, let's go to uh, mm. uh, Mr. Sunday. In your opening statement, you mentioned shell gas was a big reason why the United States have led the world in CO2 reduction because the energy and natural gas liquids in your manufacturing is less emission intense than overseas manufacturing, especially compared to countries like China. Can, is that correct? Yes, sir. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, as I mentioned, the Clean Air Task Force looked at the methane intensities, and shale gas in Appalachia has the lowest uh, leakage of any basin in the world. Mm -hmm. And the increased use of, of natural gas produced in that region, including Pennsylvania, has been estimated to be about 60 percent of the reason why we led the world in reducing emissions as a country since 05. So big picture, the issue is how do you reduce emissions, keep costs down, and be reliable? That's the long-term challenge. The short-term challenge is every country out there that's relying on Russian oil and gas, we should be doing everything we can to get our energy over there because it's also going to be used more sustainably because I can guarantee you, as, and uh, you can see the Boston Globe feature from a couple years ago when an LNG tanker uh, came into Boston. When we got shale gas in northeast Pennsylvania, it's the most prolific in the world. I definitely want the producer standards in my state versus Putin's regime. We saw what that led to. Do you know what the difference between the two standards are? Uh, it's, it's, it's an order of magnitude. I mean, okay. it's, yeah, it's so much so that even if you count for transportation across the tanker, 
shale gas in the U.S. shipped across the seas is more sustainable than pipe coming in from Russia. Because they're not using electricity in the ships to bring them here? They, they have combustible motors in them? Right. Yes, sir. Okay, that's what I was thinking. And trucks to get them to point A to point B, since we can't build pipelines in the East Coast right now. Right. Uh, with that, sir, I'll yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the chair of the committee has arrived, Senator Carper. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before uh, before I start uh, today, uh, um, Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Kelly, you may want to clarify those statements because uh, a family member serves alongside the service member too, especially a Gold Star family. And uh, and if you don't believe that, then go talk to the Gold Star families themselves because Mr. Tarverville was part of that Gold Star family. And, and you know, comment, Senator. There, but I'm just Senator, saying, I appreciate. No, no, I'm uh, not yelling time. I'm just saying you may want to clarify that statement. Well, I can clarify do, it sir. right now. I, I know, but it's my time. Um, Mr. Chalet, you have made several ta comments talking about the Biden administration's withdrawal and the success of it. Um, obviously, I have some serious concerns about that. Uh, first of all, has anybody been uh, held accountable for the disastrous withdrawal that took place, considering the American lives that were lost and how many Americans we left behind? Uh, Senator Mullen. Thank you for the question, and thank you for the time uh, in your office the other week. And I genuinely, I, I just, I just, I'm short on time. I just didn't know has anybody have been held accountable. Senator, accountability is critically important. As no, I, I'm just saying, has anybody been held accountable? That's a simple one. It's a yes or it's a no. Senator, we have get, tried to learn the lessons from has that. Has anybody been held accountable? Senator, we tried to learn the lessons from that withdrawal and I, apply I just, those lessons. No, today. so that's a no. Just is that a no? No one's been held accountable. We have tried to learn those lessons. So no one's been held accountable. We try to learn those okay, lessons. Okay, so, well, it's not hard to really learn lessons, especially when you do a good debrief. Uh, I, I, in fact, when I talked to you about it in my office, you said, well, the chips need to lie where they may. That was your comments when I was talking to you about, about, the, about the accountability. Because if we don't learn lessons, then we'll, we're, we're definitely determined to make those same mistakes again. Uh, several times, Secretary Blinken and this administration lied uh, when they said that every American that wanted out uh, got out. Do you believe those statements were accurate? Uh, Senator, I do. Oh, you do? Well, then, why was there hundreds of Americans that got out? And by the way, the night of the, of the 29th, uh, 28th, and, 20, and the 30th, I was, I was assisting trying to get those Americans out when you guys said that every American that wanted out could get out. But the truth is, the Abbey Gate, after the bombing, HKI was closed. And you know this as a fact. No one was getting in to HKIA. They were getting turned around, turned away. In fact, the morning of the 30th, um, and this is recorded on your hotline that you set up for Afghanistan, I was asked, because I had a three-year-old girl, plus I had Miriam and her three children, uh, plus a whole host of other people that we were trying to get in. And all night of the 29th, you guys were taking me from gate to gate to gate to gate to gate to gate to gate, trying to get these individuals in HKIA. And all that had to be said was that you guys had to call over the gate and ask for them because we were dealing with the Taliban. And see, the Taliban, ironically enough, if we paid them enough money, we could get Americans out. But the State Department was stopping us every step of the way. And so the morning of the 30th, your employee at the State Department asked me personally, do you have another way to get them out? Because we've closed the airport. And so for you to sit there and say that every American want to get, wanted to get out, you're absolutely lying, and you know that to be factual, and you say it with a straight face. What's bad is that three-year-old girl we're trying to get out died a few days later from a leg infection, and you all knew about it because I sent you pictures of it that's still on my phone, which is why I said it was important that we got her out through HKI because she needed serious medical attention. By the way, this wasn't a refugee. This was an American citizen, and her parents were American citizens, and you all knew this to be factual. And then when we drive her across the country and we get her to the border to Chikistan, your ambassador, Ambassador Promagine, which this is also recorded, told me personally, I was told by Washington, D.C. not to assist you in any way. Who told him that? Uh, S Senator, thanks for the question. And, and no, no, I don't want to know who told him that. I don't have much time. I don't want you to. S I don't want you to try to get around it. Who told him that? 
Senator, I, I don't know the details of well, that. Well, the State so. Department said it. Has he been held accountable? Because that three-year-old died because of her leg infection before we get her across the border. Senator, again, I, I appreciate what you did to help. No, I don't want that. Others. I don't need that. I don't need that. I want accountability. I want someone to be held accountable. Because you know what happened after that three-year-old girl died and I called you guys and I said that she died? I hung up the phone and we went black as a team and we quit communicating with you. And three days later, you guys, the State Department, released my photo and my approximate location to the Washington Post and said I was lost in Afghanistan with a bag of cash and never called my family to see if that was true. Never called my wife. You guys released it to a political rag and they ran it and they put my life in serious danger including the entire team that was trying to get the Americans out that you guys left behind. And not one single person has been held accountable. And then when Miriam and her three kids from Arlington or for Amarillo, Texas, when we finally got them out across the border of Tajikistan, without your all's help, because you guys refused to help us because you told the ambassador not to assist us anyway, Secretary Blinken, the person you was advising, goes to the podium and says, the State Department has successfully negotiated to get the first Americans out since the fall of Afghanistan. I didn't know you guys were there when she had a gun held to her hand with her two-year-old in her arms. And she started puking because she was so scared. I didn't know you guys were helping that. I didn't know you guys were making a single phone call. I didn't know you guys were there paying off the Taliban with that bag of cash that you said I had in the hands. I didn't know you guys were there. And you're going to tell me that you can't say if someone's been held accountable or not? Senator Mullen, your time's expired. There's a problem here. And there's zero chance I support you moving forward. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to get a little factual on what um, Mr. O'Brien just said about right to work states versus uh, forced work states. According to the compensation re data report, the U.S. Commerce Department, um, an average salary for private sector employee in 2019 was $4,000 higher than the average employee in forced union states, uh, stating that right to work states pay more. Um, now, if we also want to break this down to statistics, which was quoted earlier by Mr. O'Brien, about wage differences, if you talk to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in non-union jobs, their average salaries raised 14.6% compared to 11% wage increase on unionized workers from 2020 to 2023. If you go back to the percentage of uh, union workers, because if unions was working uh, so well, then you'd see an increase in union jobs, not a decrease. Um, 50 years ago, 33% of our labor force was union. Today, it's 10.1%. Uh, if you go back and you start looking at wage earns, if you actually compare at, uh, comparable wages to ages, uh, non a, not a partisan point, but you go to all wages earned, uh, not just comparing 16 and over to 54 to 64 year old ages, you'll see that the actual average, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that if you subtract the union dues, it's actually higher. Non-union employees are getting paid by roughly one to 2%, which is exactly what union dues are, is one to 2% of their salary. So I just wanted to set the record straight on that, and that's coming from statistics, all right? Now, let's talk about Mr. O'Brien himself, his behavior. As everybody knows in this hearing, the last time <laughs> him and I kind of had a back and forth. I uh, appreciate your demeanor today, it's quite different. But after you left here, you got pretty excited about the keyboard. In fact, you tweeted at me one, two, three, four, five times, and let me read what the last one said. Um, it said, greedy CEO who pretends like he's self-made. Sir, I wish you was in the truck with me when I was building my plumbing company myself, and my wife was running the office because I sure remember working pretty hard in long hours. Pretends like he's self-made. What a clown. Fraud. Always has been, always will be. Quick the tough guy act in these Senate hearings. You know where to find me, any place, any time, cowboy. 
So this is a time, this is a place. You want to run your mouth? We can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Big oh, hold, stop it. Is that your right. solution every poll? Oh, no, no, sit down. Oh, you're a clown. Sit down. Okay. You know, you're a United States senator. Sit down. Actively. Oh, okay, okay. Sit down, please. All right. Can I respond? Mr. Hold Chairman. it. Hold it. If hold we can't, no, I have the mic. I'm sorry. This is hold what it. he said. You'll have your time. Okay. Can I respond? Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> this is a hearing. And God knows the American people have enough of contempt. But Congress, let's not I don't make like it worse. Thugs and you, bullies. You have, and you have I don't like you because you just described yourself. Yeah, hold it. You have yeah. the mic. Yeah. You have time. All make right. Your statement. Then let's do this because I did challenge you and I accepted your challenge, and you went quiet. No, I didn't go quiet. I was. No, I was. No, no, you no, challenged no. me to a cage match, no, 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 acting no, no, like a twelve-year-old schoolyard hold bully. Excuse me. Hold it. No, excuse me. I, have the I mic. will say. I will say exactly. Senator Mullen, I have the mic. You have questions on any economic issues, anything that said, go for it. We're not here to talk about physical abuse. You brought We're not talking in. about, of course and, I did. And let me, tell you, let me show you his hearing, because I want to expose this thug to who he is. And Could you not point to me? That's disrespectful. All right. I don't care about respecting you at all. I, respect I don't respect that you I respect. at all. So all right, hold me, it. Let me, let hold me. it. No. You all want to be one of the most hold elite it, people please. acted. Please. All right. This is a, excuse me. Mm -hmm. This is a hearing to discuss economic issues. All right, if you have questions for Mr. O'Brien or anybody else on what he has said, go for it. I mean, but we're not here to talk about fights or I'm, anything else. I'm quoting exactly what he said. You can and say what is, you want. This is, this, is your, this is your witness this you is brought. My witness. And let me, I'm, I'm exposing him. You can ex as talk a anything you want. Right. So but in no 2013, fight. Nope. In 2013, O'Brien was suspended by the Teamsters for intimidating your own members. In 2014, uh, you were um, part of, what would you say, organizing the harassment and intimidation of the top shelf crew? Chef, not uh, chef. Tra oh, top, oh top, top chef, okay. And then, uh, and I think in the reports they said sexual r racist and homophobic slurs and death threats, 14 tires were sliced and five Teamsters were arrested, and you said, well, I had nothing to do with it, but however, in that same statement, you said, but if I get called to, to test file, I'll plead the fifth. This is, this, is what, this is a witness you brought in here. In 2017, you were removed as lead negotiator by then President Hoffa for UPS for your actions, and then in 22, when this guy was elected, what he said after he got elected was he wanted to bring the mob mentality back to the Teamsters. This is your guy. And you're he, obviously going to give him a chance to respond can, to your question. Oh, questions. absolutely, absolutely, because this is my question. Because you called me out. I didn't call you out. Yeah, you, did. you said any time, any place. That's, That's that. Said, that right? Let's get the record okay. straight. Miss, hold it. No. Hold on. Ms. Senator Mullen, do you have a question for the witness? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's hear it. So, any time, any place. No, that's April, not. April, April is a charity event. No, that's not, that's no, not, no. No, it's a, he, no, sir, we, he said it, and this is my He is time. here to tell, no. He set parameters on what the questions can or cannot be asked, and I'll ask No, you're not going to, we're not going to be talking about yeah, physical did. confrontation. Oh, this is about charity, for a union charity, because this, this is for is, firefighters. And do you have a question April, on his testimony? April, 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 Charges. Mr. Mr. O'Brien, do you want to respond to yeah, go the ahead, question? Please. Yeah, I mean, look, the reality of it is, you Except know, my Mr. 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 Guy. Mullen, <laughs> tough guy. Answer, yeah. hold it. Answer the questions. All right, you all want, if I, he, he made a lot of statements, right? And his statements are fiction at best. Fiction, I read them. Can you where, where, where? What? Hold, answer the question, please. I can't understand him, to be honest with you. All right. He rambles so much. What was your question, actually? Well, you said I made a lot of statements. No, but what's your question? I don't understand your question. Could you repeat it? You said any time, any place. What's your question? Accept the challenge. What challenge? You said any time, any place. I'm accepting yours, so why don't you come What back? challenge? What challenge are you talking April about? April 30th. How about we do it for a charity at the Smoking Guns in Tulsa, Oklahoma? No, we're, we're not going to be talking about physical confrontations here. You want to fight me? 
What do you say by anytime, any place? Let's have coffee. Discuss our differences. Oh, oh, that's what you said. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. All right. Well, let's say I don't have coffee. Let's I'd do it. To. All right. I'd love to. But do the, it. It's funny how you're back. Okay. I don't back on anything. You did. You're right. the one. You're a 100. Senator should be the most influential people in this country making changes. Senator you're focused on. Okay. Why, you're focused you. on why debate that's not even relevant. You're an embarrassment. You're an embarrassment. Look, after an embarrassment to the state of this hearing is about the condition of the working class in America. You That's what we're talking about. You're the biggest thug here. You brought, you brought him in. All right, you're you're big, the biggest thug. Even look, your colleagues call you. Why you do what you're doing, Senator Hassan? Thank you very much, Mr. Senator Chair. Hassan, you Senator Mullen, please yield. I've been recognized no, by the chair. Got, Act according. Uh, now, Act is yours. Uh, but up, Senator Mullen wants to say a few words, then I'll say a few words. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave the last statement for Mr. O'Brien completely alone and move on past it. If you do want to truly really have that cup of coffee, reach out. We'll sit down and talk about it. Now, my differences with Mr. O'Brien has nothing to do with, with unions. Zero. I have no, no problem with unions. I have problems with unions forcing people to join unions. Uh, but there's a place for them. And, and those that choose to join the union, join it. What is that? I have no issues with that. Mr. Finn, what is I enjoyed uh, your behavior uh, and, and honestly your comments. Mm -hmm. Ms. Nelson, I enjoyed the fight. really do. And I want to make it very clear. For people that want to join the union, that's fine. I believe in right to work states and let the employer and the employee make the best decision what's best for their company. And that's it. Um, at the end of the day, no company survives without employees. And no employees are hired without the company. It takes both and the same boat rowing the same direction to be successful. I'm only moderately successful because I was fortunate <laughs> enough to have great employees that worked for me for a long time and I was able to build a company with them. At the same time, they were up to actually able to live a very successful life too. So appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the witnesses that came in. Thank you. Thank you. We are today. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Senator, just tell us yeah. why you think what happened today in the hearing happened. Well, I, you should probably ask him that. I mean, he was the one that kept tweeting at us. Uh, we didn't respond until the fifth tweet. And when he said, any place or any time, any place, you know where to find me, cowboy, I thought, well, this is the time, this is the place. and. You don't do that in Oklahoma. You don't run your mouth unless you're going to answer the call. Well, that might be the question. Was that the place? Is a Senate hearing the right place to challenge someone to a physical confrontation? Well, I'd already challenged him to September 30th. He could have done it then for charity. Um, I said April. They have the, the uh, what's it called the smoking guns charity for the firefighters and police force. We could have done it then. I've been happy to, but he said stand up, and so I stood up. Yeah, but what about, I mean, just the idea that fighting as a way to solve a problem, is that kind of, are you concerned that that's, the way the conversation is happening here on Capitol Hill? People have been fighting for a long time. I mean, go back to the 1800s, they used to have canings. It was legal to do duels. Um, if you have a difference, you have a difference. I didn't start it. I didn't tweet at him. I didn't go after him. I have no beef with the guy. I mean, I don't even know the last time I've gotten a street fight. I used to get paid to fight. I'm not, I'm not looking, I mean, what do I have? What victory is it for me to beat up O'Brien? That, that would be a shock, right? Uh, but he said it. And I just simply responded. If he wants to call it off and we just go have a cup of coffee, fine. Let's say I don't have a cup of coffee. I have no hard feelings. It's not personal to me. He just challenged me, and I accepted the challenge. Do you, do you regret it? Regret this moment at all? You should probably ask him. I mean, he's the one that said it. <clears throat> I don't regret asking him. You know, he, he said any time, any place. So. And has leadership talked to you at all about, about this? No. No, not at all. Have you begun any outreach <coughs> to him at all, or has he reached out to you, O'Brien, meaning? No. Reach out to you afterwards. No, so. not, not, you know, I ended it and said, if you, if you want to end it here, that's fine. If you want to sit down and have a cup of coffee, I'll sit down and have a cup of coffee. It's not personal to me, guys. This is not nothing personal. It's just he made the challenge, and I accepted it. It's just that simple. What about just the general tension right now on Capitol Hill? Do you feel as though things are, there's more angst than there has been at other times, and is it preventing you from getting things done? I don't, you know, I can only speak for my time here, right? Uh, every since I've been here, there's always been a little bit of tension. This is a total separate issue. You know, this doesn't have to do with policy. This doesn't have to do with politics. This had to do with a guy calling me out, and I simply responded to it. Uh, that, that's so. I don't think the two are really comparable. This has nothing to do with me against unions either. I have nothing against unions. I made that very clear at the end of the hearing. I have nothing against unions. A lot of good friends and family are, are union members. This has to do with just his thug mentality. I mean, you look at his background, look at his history. The guy has a history of this, constantly. Um, I mean, and he was the one after he got became president. He was the one to bring back the mob mentality. What the heck is a mob mentality? 
and then you're going to bring that mob mentality to me? Okay, well, you can't run your mouth against me. I'm just not that guy. If you want to run your mouth, then we can settle it a different way. But you don't do that. And for especially somebody from Oklahoma, maybe you can do that from someone from New Jersey or New York. I don't know. I've never lived there. But in Oklahoma, you don't do that. It's the same thing. You don't flip somebody off unless you want to get your finger broken in Oklahoma. That's just the way it happens. Here, people seem to use that gesture all the time, and it's not the same. Words matter in Oklahoma. There were some tips also on the House side today. And more broadly, what do you think could be done to, like, lower the temperature? Yeah, of, you, you know, know bring more discourse here. That old stuff with, with Burchett and, and Kevin McCarthy, I, I don't I – don't, Birch is not a man of character, and I don't uh, I don't take that with I take what he said with not even a grain of salt. I don't believe a word that he says. And do you feel confident that it, once this uh, continuing re resolution, if it ultimately passes, I mean you're not really solving any of the problems, right? <laughs> no. I mean, how can you get all this stuff done in a short period of time? You know, with a, with a continuing resolution, we're going to kick the can down the road again. Uh, everybody here right now knows that we're probably going to do another CR in January. Um, what we, in my opinion. Uh, I don't want to shut down the government. Okay, keep the government open. But at some point, we need to call a spade a spade. Get, do a continuing resolution through the rest of the year. Call it a funding bill. Do a supplement for the Department of Defense. And then let's start working on FY25 because we're going to cut into that time. If we don't start FY25 before long, we're going to do the same thing with FY25. Do you wish Johnson had taken a, a different approach? I don't think he could take a different approach. I mean, it's the cards that was dealt him. He had a, this is the only hand he had to deal or, or had to play. So I, uh, I I don't think he really had a different choice. I think he's doing the best he can by splitting up in two packages, giving us at least an opportunity to work through some appropriation bills. But I don't even know how we'll have time to do that. Uh, the, work, the bills are so different between so much different between the two. You, you even by the time you go to conference, yeah. you, I don't think you can get them out of conference. I mean, how long did NDA take last night to get out of conference? And so. We got a lot of work ahead of us, for sure. All right, guys, we got to go. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Was it necessary to do something so provocative at that hearing? I don't know what provocative is. I mean, he's the one that said stand up. I just simply read his tweet. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it, sir.